here. Perfect. Hi, everybody. Wow, this is so cool. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, before I start, I also would like to just acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today, um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and just pay respects to their um, elders past, present and emerging. Um, Thank you for being here. I know it's a crazy time of year, so it's really cool to see so many faces. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you today about uh, the topic of silence or rather um, breaking the silence. So I'm Courtney Holm, as you know, I'm the founder of ABCH. And yeah, thanks for the lovely intro, Jeremy. I think um, that's it really just sums up what we're all about. We're really focused um, on it at ABCH on transforming this industry and also just how we see um, consumption. So look, what I really want to talk to you guys about today is a little bit about our story and um, my story personally. And I guess some of the things that I've come up against in the industry um, that I've been working in for quite a few years now. And um, I guess a long time ago, I learned that solving surface issues wasn't really practical um, or helpful for, helpful for achieving long-term change. And transformation only really occurs when the deepest underlying issue is addressed. And I learned this back in the day. I come from a hospitality background. I studied fashion, design, and business. But back in my hospo days, um, I learned about root cause analysis and how you can't just address the surface issues. You have to really ask all the questions to figure out what is at the heart of that problem. And so, you know, as an example, we used to address, um, you know, if we had staffing issues or, you know, people just not showing up for work or calling in sick, we had to address a, a culture issue. And um, quality issues were resolved by looking at our training and how we actually um, approached how we teach people how to provide good quality. And so um, this kind of concept has really stuck with me since those days. And it seems kind of straightforward and easy to go, oh yeah, well, there's probably a problem underneath, but the industry that I work in is um, a little bit uh, different from that. Um, so fashion has a lot of problems and you may know about them and maybe you're just starting your journey of learning about them. So as the second largest polluter of the planet's fresh water and allegedly contributing more um, carbon emissions than all of the air travel and maritime travel combined each year, our clothes pile up in our closets. And it's really amazing because we throw 6,000 kilos of clothes away every 10 minutes in Australia. And this is a picture from War on Waste where that um, was kind of highlighted to the masses. And look, the clothes that pile up in our closets just have a much higher impact than the price that we probably paid for them. And so root cause analysis, if I think about this for a second, it's like nothing new to like the science or engineering world, but the fashion industry just doesn't seem to care much for this concept. And it's, um, I guess it's an uncomfortable thought um, because the people who run the show and make decisions in, in the fashion industry, um, you know, they're looking at symptomatic things and things that maybe will affect uh, a customer or their marketing strategy, but they will refuse to accept that there are painful, deep truths to address um, because it's a very profitable industry. So the problems are far wide and complex from factory collapses and fires that claim the lives of workers, mostly of whom are women abhorrent inequality, and a constant devouring of the planet's natural finite resources. The annual use of water in cotton production alone could quench the thirst of every human on the planet for three whole years. That kind of blows my mind. That's the second highest um, fiber that we use in, in fashion. Um, the highest, uh, the largest amount of fiber that we use in fashion is polyester, and polyester is plastic. And um, we all know the problems with plastic at the moment, um, entering into the ocean being one of the, the main things. And microfibers are um, not just a problem in the short term for our sea life, but also in the long term for human food supply. And with the third most popular fiber, around 30% of it, and this is viscose I'm speaking about, is made uh, uh, by chopping down endangered and ancient forests. So we've got some pretty... <laughs> 
we've got some pretty big problems and I'm not here to like be negative. I have some, some solutions hopefully to offer at the end of all of this because there's no actual magical um, band-aid solution for it all. We do have to dig deeper and understand um, what those root causes are. So how can you solve a problem when no one wants to talk about the root cause? That's a question that I'm kind of posing in this, in this talk today. And I'd love to kind of now go back and share a little bit about the journey of ABCH because the theme of silence, it really resonated with me because throughout the time that I've spent working in and on this business, I've had countless pushback, people trying to kind of silence the things that I really believed in um, and the things that myself and the team were really trying to get out there into the world. And, you know, I've had colleagues saying that talking about my business made them feel bad and they didn't want me to be so upfront about it. Um, I've had industry experts naysay, including mentors, and I've had friends vaguely say, that's nice to hear, but not really seem to understand, I guess, the I guess the whole the whole picture. And so it's been a constant challenge to remain open and to stand by what I believe. And I guess what I believe all started with the desire to provide a simple solution to these really complicated problems and to uncover and expose the silence root cause of how things have gone so wrong for this industry. This is an image of how um, the circular economy is different from the linear economy and even the recycling economy. I don't know how many people have like a bit of knowledge or heard about the circular economy before. Amazing. This is really cool. I'm so happy to see many hands. Um, if you don't know about it, Google it later. But this is a really good kind of illustration of how it, it sort of works. It's very simple, but very powerful. It's a whole new system for creating, using, and discarding where nothing's actually wasted and everything is deemed valuable. And what I did learn about sustainability when I was like at uni, you know, it, it, was, it was never really anything to do with my practice as a designer um, and not really nothing to do with the fashion industry at all. It was a very separate sort of mindset. And so while I might've had personal values rooted in, you know, wasting less and you know, being conscious, it never really occurred to me that my personal practice and my personal values would be able to collide one day. So I finished school, I finished uni, and then the Rana Plaza factory collapsed, which was a devastating um, moment in the, in the fashion world where over 1,100 people lost their lives and thousands more were maimed in Bangladesh um, due to a fashion producing, fast fashion producing factory collapsing um, in awful, terrible work conditions. And this was something that really stuck with me and was a devastating example of what overconsumption was doing in this industry. And it was something that can, had kind of been bubbling away under the surface, but no one was really talking about it until this moment. And so from that point on, personally, I just started to get fascinated with what was going on. And I guess, was anybody kind of addressing this issue of overconsumption and the pressure that was being put on supply chains and the pressure that we were putting on the planet. And so I started digging around and seeing what, what was going on, watching documentaries, reading books. And if anyone wants like a little reading list later, come and see me. Um, but it was a personal journey as well as a professional journey. And I started to realize that I personally had been marketed to for so long that I wasn't enough without having more. And so that was a really big shift in my thinking when I realized that was all a lie. And that's sort of kind of what started this whole journey. And then I'd already started a menswear label at this point in time. And it was, you know, something I liked. It was a little hobby that I was enjoying, but it wasn't really something that I really believed in, that it was firmly kind of planted in, in values. And so at this moment when this was all starting to happen, I watched a movie called The True Cost, which I... I'm sure some of you have seen, um, very emotional movie. And even though I'd kind of been learning about a lot of this stuff, that movie just did something to me and it all just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, you know, I've got to get out of this industry fully. I don't even want to be touching it. It's, it's that toxic. And I thought I've got to get out, had some time to think. And I was like, you know, 
I'm either out of this or I try to come up with a solution that's going to radically shift and radically change this industry. And it was kind of a scary thought. Um, and I thought, you know, it would be really viable for me to stay silent, to just kind of do work on my own self as a person and stay in the boundaries which I felt I could achieve on my own. But that wasn't to be. Um, I like to get shit done and it's just like who I am. I, I, I start to get this kind of idea in my head and I think, you know what, I feel like I can have an impact here. And suddenly I got really energized. Um, ironically, this was all happening um, when I was away on my honeymoon in Fiji, having a little break away from everything. And I just found that there, that like self-silencing sort of nature of the busy day-to-day -day normal life was replaced with this amazing natural crashing waves, wind, birds, and I could just think and it was incredible. And I came up with kind of a roadmap for what ABCH would be and didn't have a name at that point, um, but came up with, I guess, the values of, of what I wanted to achieve right then and there. I kind of wrote a mission statement and then I did a whole bunch of root cause analysis. I was like, what are the problems? Why, why, why? Until I got to what the real heart of the issue was. So at that point, I knew that it was about something much bigger than my own strengths and abilities and it was going to go much farther beyond what I thought I could do. So one thing that became abundantly clear was that the way we design and make things, and today I'm specifically talking about clothing, but this could be applied to multiple industries where you're creating product. It's not very smart. And existing without waste, without exploitation, without ecological disruption, I mean, it gets a lot more straightforward when the design process gets disrupted and when we start to transform the thinking of what design actually is. Are we just making beautiful products? Are we making something that serves a function and then we get rid of it when it's no longer useful? Or are we looking at design in a whole new way where we're understanding that everything that goes into that product from the energy to the water to the materials and all of the kind of sub things that happen in between the transport, absolutely everything. When you look at this whole big picture, you start to understand that um, circular, the circular economy just makes so much more sense than the linear economy. And so this is what I started to do to my own design practice. And it's completely changed the way I design. I used to draw pretty pictures on a piece of paper. And now it's all about sourcing and uncovering the details before I even think about what I'm going to make. This is me sourcing. <laughs> I'm visiting some cotton farms and, you know, getting in there. I'm a maker and a designer. So, you know, for me, it's, it's a very tactile experience as well. So, you know, we, we visited Origin from the cotton and linen farms to the textile mills, the dye houses, tracing every step, mapping the impact um, at each level, and then coming up with life cycle assessments to determine what was the best possible way to make a product. And a life cycle assessment shouldn't just consider the supply chain, but also the end of life. And so we do something called designing with the end in mind. And I think that that kind of philosophy is really important for designing for circularity and for, I guess, starting to think about um, how much we're consuming. It really does shed a lot of light on how much textile and waste is coming out of that process. So that's how we roll. <laughs> it's a total shift in thinking away from the selling and into the life and use of a garment as well. And so we do things a little bit differently um, this is just my picture of the whole process. And, you know, it's not just about, as you can see, like the supply chain and how you actually get the raw materials and make a garment. It's about the reuse, the repair, the, um, you know, resale, getting customers involved in all of those processes. That's one thing we are really passionate about at ABCH. Eventually, at the very end, last resort, you're in recycling or composting. Um, rather than the bin situation, which is kind of what happens right now. Has anyone ever had a garment or a product and you finished with it because it broke or it's no longer useful and you're like, what do I do with this? Like it doesn't go in the bin, it doesn't go in the recycling bin. Like 
I can't compost it. Like it's, it's, it's crazy to think that we have so much stuff in our lives and there's nowhere for it to go. And so I think that transforming this sort of this idea and thinking about this, it's something that doesn't get talked about nearly enough in this industry. Um, the other thing that I'm really passionate about is, I guess, talking to customers about their part in this process and not just like palming off a garment to them and then staying quiet and being like, hey, that's it. We've, we've sold something and we're, we're done with you now. Good luck to you. But it's about, okay, now that the customer has bought something, we're going to stick with you. We're going to tell you how you can extend the life of that garment, how to repair it one day. We're going to give you a care manual so you know exactly what to do with it when it comes to laundry time that's not this big inside the garment but actually has useful information that's very specific. And I think that it's all about making that customer fall in love with something they already have rather than telling them that they need the next thing in the next um, if, of the next season. And so in this industry, the fashion industry loves to deal with surface issues. You know, they'll increase their recycled polyester or they'll put up a code of conduct at their factories and think that that's okay. But really, we're not talking about something and it's overconsumption. And that's something that is a painful thing to talk about because it challenges each and every one of us at a personal level and at a professional level if you are in that kind of business, which a lot of us are. So overconsumption, I think, is the root cause of why we're in the mess that we're in. And while the transformational change of the circular economy is amazing and it's needed right now, it's also kind of tended to allow the decision makers to kind of hold back and stay really quiet about this overconsumption issue. We are happy to talk about circularity at conferences, but people aren't so happy to talk about how much they're making and to start talking about how do we make less, how do we sell less. It's kind of a tricky one. And I have a fashion business and I have the same tensions in my own business as well. So, look, I think we really need to explore new post-growth models. And ABCH has kind of been a testing ground for that, which is really exciting because what I want to do is prove it's possible so other people feel like they can do it as well. And, look, I think... The thing with what we're doing is not about, and I said before, it's not really about selling more stuff, but it's about education and involving that customer, opening up that conversation, keeping it something that we can do in a kind way and in a way that gets people excited and doesn't feel like they're restricting themselves, but they can be even more creative with what they have. You know, we don't do um, traditional retail. We don't ever put things on sale or discount because we don't want people to ever feel like, you know, they're buying something at a price and then it goes on sale later and they've kind of been ripped off. Um, and we don't want to make people feel like they're missing out because the next season is coming and they've got to update their wardrobe. We really like to try to create events and special moments for people. This is like a picture from one of our pop-ups we did this year, which was all about the... I guess the origin of a natural fiber, undyed, untouched by anything, and really um, allowing customers to experience that in a really tangible way. And look, I could answer a lot of questions about the company, but yeah, I think we'll save that for Q&A. The thing I just wanted to do um, before we do that is I'm all, I'm all about action and doing, and I love to kind of reach the end of a conversation and have like, okay, what do we do now? What are the next steps? And so this is just kind of a bit more of a generic, my tips for how to not be silenced yourself in whatever industry or business or situation you are in. And I think the top one, they're kind of in order of importance, I think, is to know your values, taking responsibility like as yourself, as well as in your professional capacity. Speaking up, I think a lot of the times I've been so nervous to speak up because what if people scrutinize me? If I start talking about sustainability, but I own a fashion business, what if people start to say, well, you shouldn't have a fashion business at all if you really care about sustainability? But I think that that flows into the next one, which is addressing consumption head on. So not shying away from it and just tucking it away and hoping no one notices. And this is really rampant in the fashion industry. But being like, hey, let's bring these issues out and let's have a conversation about them. Ditching the idea of growth at any cost. 
And I've mentioned fundamentally changing design and we also need to find ways to um, start to curb the carbon emissions and become carbon positive, not just reduce the impact on the planet, but actually be a positive impact on the planet. I think that's a different way of thinking. And also leading the consumer. I use that in you know quotations because I hate that word so much. Um, I want it to be about being a global citizen rather than being someone who's just like consuming, consuming. And I think that it feels better. You feel so much better when you don't feel like a consumer. Focusing on renewable resources and replenishing and value the entire um, you know, process where humans are involved and putting value on each of those people. In my industry, the person who sews and makes is often kind of pushed to the bottom as the lowest of the low. I think that the making and the crafting process is one of the most beautiful creative parts of design. And I am passionate about making that part of the design process and it being on equal footing with the design. Um, so that's just my, my thoughts on it. Um, and if what you're dreaming about doesn't exist, then invent it. When I started this business, there was no such thing as a circular fashion label. And it was all a bit crazy at the time, but look, it's now becoming um, much more talked about and we're being used as an example in a lot of um, universities and industry examples. And so I think it's, it's not crazy to dream and to go for it, um, even when everyone around you tells you to be quiet. That's about it from me today. I put up our website because not because I'm trying to say go buy clothes, <laughs> I'm not, but I would love for you to check out some of the resources we have on there. We have tons of free information to learn just about the fashion industry and lots of different topics. And our Instagram's up there too. We'd love for you to follow along with our journey. But thank you so much. And I'd love to hear your questions. Yeah.